G'day, welcome back to the channel. It's uh, pretty hot today, so just sort of get out. It's about 38 degrees, but I just sort of get out and have a crack anyway. So I'm going to have a go at uh, the seat runners now on the VH on VH Commodore seat runners to turn them into WB Ute seat runners. So come on in, let's get into it. So anyway, if you're wondering about the hat, I haven't been watching too much Yellowstone. I've just, uh, yeah, trying to get the sun off my face and this thing does a good job. Anyway, all right, so anyone that's got a WB Ute with bucket seats will know about the seat runners. And for those who don't, basically the seat runners in the bucket seats in the WB are different to the HZs and all that kind of stuff. They've got a, a different kind of runner at the front, which drops down, sort of acts like a bit of a spring yeah, so anyway, it's, it's a piece of metal, it's about three mil thick. It's got a 25 mil taper drop and it bolts in at the front, sitting forward of this main runner. And they're specific only to the WB Utes and they're really hard to find. You won't get a HZ or any kind of H series earlier than that runner that will fit. But what you will get is VH Commodore runners or I think, you know, VB, VH Commodore have the similar runner, but they have a different kind of base. So they've got those two circular um, washers as a raising uh, platform. And then you've got a bolt that goes through this one and you've got a welded actually fixing up there. So I'm, I'm gonna be using this. This has got drawings of the seat runners in it actually. And they're not very detailed about that piece, but I've got some photos sent through from a couple of people that have been uh, following the channel and they've got some runners. So I've just, it's a pretty crude part. It's not exactly a rocket science to fabricate. What I'm gonna do is the hardest part is um, for these, on the base of these, you've got to knock this one off and where this hole is here and where this hole is there. Yeah, so that hole there and that hole there will be the holes that you use for, will be the holes that you use for the rivets. And they were riveted on as part of um, engineering. I don't know why they riveted them on, but that's the way it was done. So unless you do it exactly the same way it was, it was engineered, they might pick it up, or they probably will pick it up at roadway, then you will get it, uh, yeah, you will get a rejection on it. So um, that's why a lot of people just buy the, the, U, the WB Ute runners and be done with it. I've got some VH Commodore seats. Now the VH Commodore seats are identical pattern and style as the WB. So they've just rolled over that manufacturing of the seats from whoever was doing them, but they changed the runners um, and that's the only difference. First of all, to buy these seats, WB Ute seats, to, for ones that are in mediocre condition are around four to $500. Now, if you get the runners with that, which is a bonus. Typically, you'll have to repair the seat as well. I get a quote through one guy, <clears throat> was quoting me $2,000 just for the skin of the seats so i'm not going to be paying that kind of money i'm going to basically repaint those black and repair what's already done and down the track you know i might look at actually redoing the seats completely so i'm going to be spending my money on the carpet the headliner <coughs> door cards kick panels all that kind of stuff and uh, the seats can be done at a later stage and i'll fix what i've got at the moment they're not terrible they're still pretty good first things first i'm going to knock this this uh little wash her off and we'll start to look at fabricating that, uh, that first bracket.
All right, so this is what I'm proposing for the rivet. There, that's the factory hole that was had that uh, that mount on it, and that's just a hole that's been drilled in there. I'm pretty sure from another mounting. That is probably just an access hole to get through to the Allen key holes further up. Because I didn't uh, get organised and get rivets or ordered, I ended up just getting some steel rod and I was thinking I'll fashion them up that way, but uh, it ends up being too thick. I don't think you need them. For factory, the heads were about that wide, but the actual base would have been thinner. So then I thought, well, let's use a, a nail because I've seen guys use these because they've already got the flat head on it and this reasonably thick core and you just trim it to size and then flatten the other side and there's your solid rivet holding your piece in. Um, but I think these are a little bit bigger. So these just, uh, I'm not too sure what they are, but I found them at the hardware store. They've got a slight taper there, which is not ideal, but I think I, with, it, with hammering, I can just hammer that down anyway. So they're a bit thicker and they've already got half the rivet done for me. Yeah, so it's just a matter of trimming that to the length that you need, and then you can slot it in. And that f looks like the factory rivet that I've seen on my example. So um, basically you wanna drill your two holes here. That bracket will sit there. So that'll be attached like that. And that'll be on the floor pan. And then this isn't the hole obviously, but when you drill your two holes, I would say that you put the rivet in from that side and then you can chock this up at the back with a piece of metal and then hammer the front section which will seal it in and, uh, and that'll be it. So the only reason I'm doing that is to try and keep it pretty much factory because I was just nervous about um, roadworthy, you know. If you keep it exactly the way it popped out of the factory then they can't really knock you back. It'd be a lot easier just to to do a little spot weld on the back there once it's in and then you're done. Um, but I'll give the rivet a go first and we'll see how they hold. I'm pretty sure they'll be good. And um, yeah, then we'll just go from there. Worst case scenario, I'll just pop a little bit of weld on it on this section here. Um, and if you ever needed to remove it, you just grind off that weld and it would fall out the bottom. So anyway, that's the plan and I'm pretty sure it's a sound plan. So. I'm just going to fabricate. First of all, I'm just going to give this a bit of a temper. Got a butane torch. Now, I don't know if this is going to be hot enough, but the idea is to heat it up and cool it rapidly and then heat it mildly and cool it again. And then that should be a harder steel, um, sort of a harder spring steel, depending on it. Like it's a bit of a bush, bush job because I think you've got to really going to know what steel you're using and all that kind of stuff as to how hot you heat it but I'm gonna give it a go anyway and um, see what happens. So here we go. Okay, so I've got the first one fabricated. I've uh, welded those two washers together, <coughs> put a bit of zinc around it, smoothed it off within reason. I've got a bit of zinc on this bracket, drilled the holes there and lined them up. And I've made my two rivets out of those two nails. So they've got a good length on them, both even. So now I'm just going to set up a jig dolly in there and rest that on top of it and then hammer, yeah, hammer the other end of the rivets and we'll see what happens. Hopefully, hopefully they hold and um, it's a success. All right, those, uh, that is it mounted with the back section and then the spring riveted on. I've just used this for placement for now. I, don't, I think when I final get final uh, bolts, I'll probably use a flatter bolt. You don't want that sort of sticking up in the carpet, but I don't think that would be the end of the world anyway. And uh, yeah, you can see the rivets there at the top and I've just put a, a bolt there for now. It's not the right one, but yeah, like that's not even done. It's just hand tight and that is uh, pretty stable. So it's not completely flat on this rear section here, but once you put the um, butyl rubber down, 
then um, yeah, it'll give a little bit more padding down there. And uh, obviously the carpet as well. So now really all I've got to do that I've proven that method is uh, fabricate three more, which I won't go into the process of uh, going into, but uh, yeah, that's how you mount, or that's how you convert an early Commodore seat runner to fit a WB bucket seat with the factory mounts in the tub. I'd heard you could do it. I couldn't find anything online. And that's how I did it, to replicate the closest factory mount um, on the WB runner, the bit difference being that's flat on the WB and I've made it round that the front is identical and it's riveted exactly the same as well. So there you go, if you've got some Commodore runners lying around, um, you can use them and do this mod to, uh, to get your WB uh, buckets on there or not even use your buckets, just use BH Commodore, VC, VB Commodore bucket seats, which are identical to the, uh, the WB. So now that the mounts are done, on one seat at least anyway, just wanted to show you what I was dealing with. So these are the original seats that came in the ute. Now from what I can determine, they're from a VL Commodore, I think, or a VN. Um, so yeah, it's like a suede kind of material, probably polyester of some description. And yeah, the mounts were pretty much just mounted on the way that they were for the VL and they just drilled straight through the floor pan as I showed you before. I don't want to use these. They've, they were actually in pretty good nick until a couple of rats got to them on the rear side and just ate a little bit of the material, but I'm actually selling these. So if anyone wants some VL uh, Commodore seats or VN, um, yeah, they're up for grabs. And this is what I'm updating with. So I went through the runners. I don't think I've actually gone over the seats in too much description or in too much detail. So, so basically these are from an old Commodore. So they're a vinyl and they're an identical pattern to the WBs. Yeah, so obviously they kept the last generation seat from the WB and rolled it over to the Commodores earlier on. They probably used the same manufacturer. Uh, this was, I think originally a tan or a buckskin color. And yeah, they painted it black with vinyl dye. This one is, was probably the passenger side, I'd say. It's in pretty good nick. Now that I've done the two runners, as you can see here, just painted them with an epoxy black in satin. They've come up really good, I'm really happy with them. They, they look factory, except for, if it wasn't for um, the round section at the back, you'd never know the difference, you know, being that, uh, the WBs had a square piece of three mil plate there. But I actually think this one's actually, well, it's easier to fabricate if you've got old Commodore mounts just to do that. Take the spacer off the front, put it at the back, fabricate that front section up and uh, pop rivet. Now I'm, I'm thinking I might even make a few of these and, uh, and sell them if anyone wants to do the same thing on their, their utes. It's very easy to fabricate, but if you don't, if you can't be bothered then yeah, I might even do a little conversion kit down the track. I'm not too sure yet. Um, anyway, so this is what I'm dealing with. This seat will do quite well with a restoration, I'm pretty sure. Just a good clean and a vinyl spray. And, uh, and she'll be pretty much there. This side here, I would imagine would have been the driver's side. Purely because more damage sliding in and out all the time. And you've got some wear here, which is actually quite bad. It's eaten into the foam and torn straight through that, uh, that vinyl casing there, as well as here, you've got a bit of a tear and here. Initially, when I first saw this seat, I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna have to get them re scun somewhere or get some new skins for them. And yeah, I basically did some research 
and it was around about two grand or something to get some skins. And I don't know if that was per seat. And I thought that's astronomically expensive. Plus motor trimmers at the moment are, um, yeah, they're very swamped. And so therefore you'd be waiting forever. So like, you know what, they're not too bad. Maybe I'll just, to get them over the line, I'll try and fix them. And with research, there's actually quite a few methods that you can do yourself. Um, and the pro guys actually do this as well. To, to fix vinyl, and because it is a plastic material, it uh, lends well to repairing with some plastic products. So I've got this in my research, I've gone and got the following products to try and fix it. So starting off, I've just got some foam. Um, so that will come in handy to replace that foam in there. I'll just cut off a section, stick it on, and then carve out um, an area to fit that area there so I can fill up that space. I'll use some water-based quick grip, which will spray onto the foam to adhere it. So it's a water base, so it doesn't melt the foam. I got that from Clark Rubber. This is a normal standard vinyl with a bit of a pattern on it. Now, just checking the two patterns, this one's a lot coarser than that one. So it's not really gonna match, but I'm just gonna use this as a backing once I put the foam in. I'm gonna cut a section and actually put a backing behind there and that will help adhere to what I'm gonna do after that stage, which is use some plastic bumper filler. Now, I'm up in the air with this. It wasn't cheap, $25 for a little tube, but it is a two-part filler that you will be able to use on plastic. So it's flexible and I'm hoping that that will take a bit of the brunt of actually doing it. Now, I could have used well, the final stage, I was going to use some Sikaflex automotive adhesive sealant. And I'm going to actually use this like, um, I suppose, like body filler. But yeah, that'll do the final layer of a really flexible layer that you can then sort of pattern with this vinyl. So I'm going to use it so like a long, flat plastic trowel and just trowel over it. Once that filler underneath and the foam's put, been put in. Um, and then finally, once that's cured and set, I'm going to paint the whole thing with the black vinyl um, paint. And this is a matte kind of finish. I know that's gloss. I'm, yeah, I thought I'd go with the matte because I thought it might look a bit nicer. But yeah, we'll wait and see how it turns out. So anyway, all that cost about 100 bucks, And the fabrication over there is probably about, yeah, about... 50, 50 bucks, so all up, $150 in plus the seats, which were 200, so 350. Now, if you were to go and get these uh, redone, you're probably looking at, um, yeah, 1,500 bucks. Well, from what I, from my quotes, about 1,500 per seat, which I thought was astronomical. And down the track, if I want to, I'll just upgrade to a completely new set but I think this is going to look good once it's done and I'll be very surprised by how good it looks. So anyway, enough talking, let's get into it. All right, so I've got the chair out here. Now I'm just going to give you a rundown of what I'm going to do. Based on my research, 90% of the people would probably just take this to a, a motor trimmer and get it done professionally. So I'm going to try and fix it myself because they're not, I don't think, too far gone. So this section here, as you can see, is the worst bit. Then I've got a little section here and then around the front and on the side. So there's a little bit to go, but what I've seen so far in my research, ultimately I'd need to take this whole thing off and expose the foam underneath to do it properly. But at the back, you got clips that you need to cut and then put back on. So it looks like a bit of a nightmare. I'm thinking I'm gonna fix it this way. If it doesn't work, fine i'll just get some new skins down the track but at least it'll get me to finished state anyway so i've just trimmed some of that foam up and i'm just going to fashion it into a rough kind of shape that will then glue onto the front of that re recess where it's worn out and that will give it some padding so then when i put the skin over it which will be this vinyl what i'll do i've seen that you can just get linen so the backing of that, just linen, then you tuck it up. So you get your foam glued in there in shape. Then I'll put the, the linen 
I might just use the vinyl because it's just, it's already black. And just tuck that underneath and glue it using some of this two-part um, epoxy filler, plastic filler. And then that will sort of grip everything, lock it in underneath. And then I'll do a final pass with some of this Sikiflex and just trowel it over so that'll give it that sort of vinyl skin. And then I'll look at uh, using some of this, just a patch to then patch in some of the texture of the vinyl. As it gets tacky, I think you do that, that section, you just tack it. Once that's done, you think you get a relatively seamless join, do a bit of sanding, because that seal is sandable. So give it a bit of a light sand if you need to then fix it up. Then I'll have the ability to do that and then finish it off with a spray can. And I reckon once you've done that, you'll be able to see maybe a little bit of a blemish, but it'll be nothing like this and it'll be usable, flexible, and it'll get me through, or I'd say years until it probably undoes itself, in which case I can probably get them re scun and redone again anyway. So, as, as I mentioned, yeah, it's a hundred bucks to get those little bits of equipment and why not have a crack, you know? Because it's, uh, and to save you, it could save you 2,000 plus dollars in getting them rescun professionally. Um, I'm not taking you away from motor trimmers out there at all, but uh, yeah, if you don't have the budget, have a go yourself. update got the foam in there nice and neat and then I put that uh, layer of vinyl over that and just stapled it a little bit there just to uh, keep it down so that'll keep a nice little void to put the filler in and I just did the other sections as well I'll probably just leave that on and stick it down and I haven't done anything to that because I can just run the filler straight in there and even there, so, yep, I'll give the filler a go now, see how we go. Okay, an update, got the filler in. Now it didn't go entirely to plan. Um, I forgot to scuff the vinyl underneath, so it was flaking off. So I basically just flaked all the uh, filler off until the area that is actually needs to be filled um, and you can see where I put that vinyl I've just filled that section there and sanded back in preparation for the next stage um, so I'm reasonably happy with it like it looks crap there but once it's in, once you've got the final two stages I reckon that it'll be almost very hard to see this section down there I've just given it a uh, the final stage so this is the Sikaflex stage um, and I'm just waiting for that to tack up a bit and then I'll um, dab it with the vinyl just to get it a bit of a pattern. So yeah, at this stage it, it does look obvious, but once again, you know, once you dab it with the vinyl and then do your final coat of paint, you know, when you get back to about this stage, you won't be able to notice it. And that was a big hole there, big hole. So um, yeah, you can see here is a slight Slight lip there, but that'll fill with a sicker flex. But other than that, like it's it's pretty much ready to go. There's a slight edge there where it's lifting, but um, once the sicker flex is over the whole thing, covering it'll seal it in. So it's pretty much locked into that foam underneath. It's just a matter of um, covering it up now and smoothing it in, and just down on the side as well. So scuffed it up with eighty grit around the vinyl so the Sikaflex will sit in there and we'll just see how it turns out, see if we can save it.
so I went back and forth trying to sort out the best technique and I redid it once. I had matte finish paint and I ended up going and buying some gloss because when I used the um, thinners, obviously the vinyl's got some sealer on it. And yeah, so you could see the matte and the areas that it, uh, the thinners had taken off the sealer. So it wasn't as glossy. So anyway, I got some, um, some gloss paint and I also got some 300 and 800 sandpaper and just feathered out that sicker flex. And then, yeah, painted over it. And I'm really happy with the result. You can still notice a little blemish, but it's, it's not uh, nowhere near what it was previously. And for now, that'll get me over the line for uh, the finish of the ute. And then, as I said, down the track, I can look at reskinning it. So that is it. Um, I'm really happy with the way that's turned out and it should be pretty durable. I'm gonna put it as the passenger seat anyway, because most of the time I'll be one up. And uh, yeah, so I won't get a lot of wear and tear. And I reckon it'll last a while to, uh, and before I get it reskinned. So the other seat's gonna be easy because it doesn't have any tears or anything in it. Um, so I'll get onto that now and then we're done. All right, second one done. This one is looking absolutely awesome. It's pretty much, looks brand new now after that paint. It was in really good nick. There's not much else I can say other than that I'm really, really happy with the way that's turned out. So that is it for the uh, restoration. Now it's time to re remount the new WB runners that are fabricated onto this and uh and fit it up and see how it sits so we'll do that now I like it. Good. It's a good position. Sits nice. I can recline it. Now, the only thing I've had to do is swap them because this was worn on the other side. So the reclining is on the left and may not have enough room when the center console, console comes in. So that's left to be uh, decided later. But I couldn't be happy with the way they turn out. You know, they've really come up nice and uh, they'll see me through for years to come. Really happy with the custom mounts and how they fit. And, and this just goes to show you why this particular model or really any Holden that was built in the 80s, you know, the, this technology was so simple that you could fabricate something like that yourself. Um, and you don't have to stuff around with electronics and, you know, s servo motors and all this kind of stuff. It was literally just two rivets and a quick little piece of three mil steel and you can alter the seats to be factory compliant from one car to the other. That's why I love these cars. They're just so easy to work on. Um, and sitting in it again, I've just, I just miss this driving this car. You know, I've drove one of these for years in uni. As I mentioned, it got stolen, but this one I drove for years before I took it apart. And now just sitting in here with this seat, just giving me another little step forward to, to finishing it. 
thought I'd wear the hat because it's always nice to know your hat can fit in the ute as well. Um, and I started with the hat, so I might as well finish with it. So, update on the gearbox. So, yeah, on my way of paying that off, it's a bit of an expense. So I've had to do it in a couple of stages, hence the, uh, the delay. And uh, I'm hopefully going to pick that up in the next two, three weeks. The engine's staring at me over there. It desperately wants to go in. But the next thing is the fuel system. I'd like to try and get that done before putting all the weight in the front, just because I've got to jack the car up and all this kind of stuff. Once that's in, then the engine, the gearbox can come in and then it's just like game on from there. That bonnet's got to be sprayed still and the nose cone, which I'll do probably in the next week. Once again, there you go, done. If you haven't, like and subscribe. Follow me on Instagram, Barnsley's Builds. Um, I'm always posting stuff. So if there's a delay, you, you sort of get to see why and what I'm doing and why there is a delay. But yeah, one step closer, I'm getting excited. All right, see you next time.